Welcome to the Smart and Start podcast, where real software engineers and real software managers discuss real software. As you all know, I am myopic middle manager, Jason Ellison, whose role is to look good in front of upper management. I manage a team of software engineers at a little startup called FeatureBase. I've been managing engineering teams at various companies since Al Gore invented the internet. On this podcast, I have my overvalued partner, Mr. Matt Jaffe. Jaffe is a world-renowned computer scientist and astrophysicist. His role here is to try to educate us all on the value of technology and why we should submit to its authority. Matt, let me hand this off to you so you can tell us about how great you are. Yeah, we gotta we gotta fix these intros, man, because uh, I'm neither world renowned nor an astrophysicist. I I dumped that after undergrad, um, but I have been writing software since uh, 2003 ish, and professionally since 2010. Um, so I like to think I have a little bit to contribute to the conversation. You are world renowned. Well, by some measures. <laughs> There are people right. in the world who know me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've, we've been uh, we've been putting out some episodes here and, uh, you know, we've gotten a couple under our belt. But uh, the word on the street uh, I've heard is that your boss put the kibosh on future fitness tests. Is that right? Yeah, I think we're only going to be able to do mental fit checks from now on rather than rather than physical ones. Um, okay. because according, according to my, my at home boss, um, uh, it's getting a little too bro Cody in here. So I've got a different challenge. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know Matt Jaffe much, uh, I can tell you one thing about him and that he loves money, loves, loves money. So I got a challenge, um, for a hundred dollars. Are you up for it? One hundred dollar. Uh, just, just to be clear, one hundred dollar bill. Yeah. Okay. So, for one hundred dollars, this one hundred dollar bill. What I want you to do is, you see that, you see that spaceship on that shelf behind you over there. That Lego spaceship. Yes. I want you to take it off the shelf, and in front of the camera, I want you to crumble it into many pieces in your hands right there and let it fall on the floor right now. hundred dollars. No, it's not no? Worth the time to put it back together. Wow. Yeah. Not worth a hundred dollars. It takes several hours, man. It takes several hours to put that back together. You think you're worth a hundred dollars. Uh, several hours. It's, it's definitely not worth it. <laughs> All right. There, everybody knows how much a time of Jaffe's time is worth. Okay. Moving on. So, Today's episode is all about estimates. Why do we need estimates? Who do they benefit? And how do we use them? So without further ado, we'll get forward on season zero, uh, episode five. Why do engineers have such trouble with estimates? Now, first part is why do we need estimates? Estimates are important for setting expectations up and down the business, right? So when you think about estimates, who do they benefit? So everybody, the company benefits from estimates. So engineers set expectations with estimates through managers, folks like myself, and then engineers or managers like myself set expectations with product who set expectations with sales, who set expectations with customers who pay you. Now they pay us because we deliver the right things at the right time. So that's why estimates are important. It's all about setting expectations and then managing their delivery. Are you are you with me so far, Mr. Matt Jaffe, on the value of estimates? I mean, that, that was a whole lot of words to basically say you need to balance the value of what you're going to create against the cost of creating it. And you, you want to make sure you're doing things that are going to bring more value to the company than what they cost or else you'll go out of business. I'm, I'm glad you were paying attention. That's that's good. Thank you. So uh, we talked about how they help planning, why planning is important. And so a couple of questions for you, Jaffe. Um, if if you were going to go see a movie, would you go if you didn't know how long it would be? Uh, that's a that's a really interesting question, actually. 
because depending on the movie, I think I think I might just 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 for the novelty of it. You know, oh. just go in and not know not know how long it's going to be. I would take a lot of snacks and probably monitor my fluid intake. Um, but I might do that. Yeah. So if there was like a, it's not like you're chained to your seat. Like if you got to go, you, you can you can okay. go. Right. So so what I'm hearing you say is if you know NASA, you know worked with a Lego company and they put on a movie and you didn't know how long it was, you just show up and you'd be there forever, right? Like literally, you could be there forever, and you'd be good with that. No. No, you you could not be there forever because if it you can cut it off whenever you want. You can say, you know what, it's not worth my time. It's not entertaining. I'm out of here. All right. How about if you were going to go to a restaurant and you didn't know how long it would take for you to be seated? Would you do that? Probably not. Typically, if I go to a restaurant and they're like, "Oh, it's going to be at least an hour," or you know, if it's if it's longer than thirty minutes, I'm probably not interested. So if if they they can't even tell me how long, uh, I'm I'm out of that. I'm out for that. Interesting. Now, you you brought up two really good points. So if if someone can't tell you how long it's going to be before you get what you want, you may not want to wait for it. Is that right? Yes. Excellent. Now the second part of that was you said, well, you know, if they tell me it's thirty minutes, and and I and I'm and I'm waiting. You're probably going to go up there and well, knowing you, you'll probably go up there in ten minutes and you'll be like, "Hey, is it ready yet?" And then you know they'll say, "No, it's not been thirty minutes." And then you'll go up at what twenty minutes, twenty two minutes, twenty seven minutes, twenty nine minutes. Is my table ready? Is that is that about right? But I mean, that sounds like something you might do. Right. Oh, <laughs> I would probably go up at forty five minutes <laughs> and feel now, bad about now, it. Now, if you go up at forty five minutes and they say it's not ready yet, what do you do? Because these are estimates, right? Yeah, They're just you always have to. You gotta, you gotta be prepared to make the decision and uh, and weigh the sunk cost uh, fallacy, and say, you know, do I do I want to continue committing resources to this, or uh, do I need to cut it loose? I knew you were. I just had a feeling you were going to bring up the sunk cost fallacy. I just, I just had a feeling. But, but it's a really good point, right? So, but could you imagine walking up to a restaurant and you say, you say to the the host or hostess there. Um, you know, how long it'll be for the table? And they go, you know what? I don't know. I just don't know. You're probably going to leave, I think, right? Well, it depends on how desirable that restaurant is. If if I've heard a million great things about this place and they just have the best food ever and it's, it's going to be a life-changing experience, I might just be prepared to wait, you know, a couple hours. Franklin Barbecue here in Austin, Texas. People line up for four or five hours to to get you know to get first uh, first go at that. So, you know, I, I think it it depends on what you expect to get out the other end. How how long and and how crappy of an estimate you're willing to put up with. Yeah. So if you're not sure how long it's going to take to put that Lego spaceship back together, you might just you might just keep doing it. Right. Four or five hours, you'll just still keep going, even though you're not exactly how much longer it's going to take. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like Legos, it's usually pretty clear, right? Like there's a thousand pieces and you're, you're putting five, five pieces a minute onto the thing on average, you, you can usually get a pretty solid idea of how long it's going to take you to finish. That's really interesting. You should say that. So it sounds like if, if you have an existing pattern of something that you've done before and you know just guessing here, but you've probably played with Legos for a long time. You know, if somebody hands you a thousand pieces of Legos, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, I've done that before. I have a good understanding of, of the complexity and how it works, and I'm probably not gonna be surprised. So I can probably give you an estimate. Does that, does that sound right? Yeah, that sounds right. Because, because you probably have, you know, like a, what would be something like that, like a confidence, confidence interval or, or a level of confidence of the complexity, right? Yeah, I mean, building a Lego set and some are more complicated than others, but basically each step, you know, they lay out, they lay out the steps in a pretty easy way. And it's, it's pretty much fixed complexity task, you know, for each step. Fixed complexity, almost like there could be a, a model for how to estimate how long it takes to put Legos together. 
oh yeah, you could absolutely build a, a pretty reliable model for that task, I think. Now, would, would, would the model for building Legos be the same for you, an expert clearly in that space compared to someone like, uh, I don't know, uh, somebody who's never played with Legos before, like a, like a troll or something like that, right? Yeah, no, I, I think you, you'd have to have a parameter in the model to uh, to kind of account for the experience level. And, it, and if it's someone who's literally never played with Legos before, there's going to be a big difference in their effectiveness between the first piece and the last. Like they're, they're going to learn a lot, you know, just in in that one set. And so their their speed of, you know, going through the steps is going to tick up throughout even just building one set. But at some point you kind of level off enough that, that you could probably dumb it down to a much simpler model that, that just does a pretty linear prediction. It almost sounds like you're talking about an estimation model. Tell, I don't, I don't know exactly what you mean by that. Tell me, no, tell me really. what an estimation well, model well, is. Well, we'll get to that. That, you know, that's kind of like uh, the second level, you know, I'll, I'll, I need to bring you along a little bit. So there's a really good book. Uh, I doubt you've read it. Uh, it's called uh, how to measure anything. You heard of it? Hubbard. I haven't heard of, heard of the author. It's excellent. I mean, could you imagine how do you measure anything, right? And and we're talking time and complexity, right? So we're not actually pulling out a ruler, but we're we're estimating anything. So I'd like to I'd like to give you an opportunity to speak. You've been pretty quiet the whole time. Um pick anything you want me to estimate. Es preferably an estimation in time. Anything. The floor is yours. Any, that I want you to. Yeah, I, I'm going to show you through example how easy it is to estimate anything. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. Let's see. Um, I I would like you to estimate how long. It will take, um, let's see, to, uh, I gotta, I gotta come up with a good. You want some time? How long There's is it going to take one. me to come up with this example? There's interesting <laughs> ones in the book, right? They talk about like, how do you measure how many fish in a lake, right? Like, how would you go about measuring that? Right? Do you pull every fish out, let it die on the beach, and count them, and then you'll know? But then all the no, fish. You just, you just take a sample. Oh, so you kind of take like a well-known, small, easily measurable section, kind of, and then and then extrapolate from that. You know, whether it's in a linear model or whether you know whatever type of articulation of risk you want there. Well, you you probably want to take. Uh, like a random sampling from from different areas in the lake to make sure it's representative because you don't know if the density of fish differs you know across different volumes of water but if you do a like a random sampling you get kind of like a monte carlo thing going on i think mm -hmm. you can extrapolate to the the total volume of the lake to figure out how many i like vegas fish are i like gambling so yeah i mean anytime i can go to monte carlo i want to be there Uh, it's one of one of the favorite F one races of the season. Oh, I just remember it from there was a video game my kids played. I think it was Cars two. And... No, that's Monaco. I'm sorry. Oh my goodness. I actually, hey, you go ahead. Too. So okay, so it's good. It's good that we actually don't have to count every fish, right? Because if we counted every fish to measure how many there were, that, that would be like it would be an estimate. It would be an actual. It would be actually. Right how many fish are there. It's not an estimate. It's not a guess. It would be a measurement of actual. And, and it's interesting because the, the name of this podcast is why do engineers, you know, why do they have such trouble with, with estimates? It's not why do have, why do engineers have, have trouble with actuals? It's, it's why do they have trouble with estimates? They, these are literal guesses. So, so Hubbard goes on to talk about, you know, it's not just the measurement, but it's, you know, what's your confidence? Like if you asked me, because I'm not a world renowned astrophysicist, if you asked me how many miles to the moon, I would embarrass myself with my answer. I would say 
I don't know, uh, 35,000 miles. And my confidence would probably be 6%, right? Because that's an absolute guess. I know it's not like 1,000 probably, unless it is. It's probably not 100,000. So 30-something you know, 30, 30 thousand miles sounds right. How many miles is it to the moon? So I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I know it's about two light seconds to the moon. Light travels at 300 million meters per second. So it's about 600 million meters, which is about 600,000 kilometers. Uh, I want to say you divide by 1.6. So you're looking at, I don't know, 400,000 miles, something like that. What would your confidence be in that? Um, I, I bet you I have it within uh, 30%. So I got to look it up now. So riddle me this. Riddle me this, like you are 38,900 miles. To, you are a software engineer and I'll go as the far as to say, not a strong estimator of software. Yet you just guessed, you just guessed at how many miles it was to the moon based on some abstract notion of the speed of light. Yet, yet you were able to provide an incredibly accurate estimate. How was that? How did you do that? Um, what well, I just talked through my entire reasoning. I don't know what because you're because you're pretty familiar with with space time continuums and stuff, and you know about lights and speeds, and that's cool. Um, and and that made it pretty easy to come up with an estimate. But but you also know a lot about software too, don't you? So to be fair, I was off by uh, not quite a factor or two, slightly less than a factor or two. So. Still not not a spectacular estimate. How many how many Monte Cristos is that? <laughs> how many sandwiches stacked on on top of each other? I don't know. What what are you what are you asking me? All right. So estimates. Now now you talked a little bit earlier about coming up with a, an estimation model for Legos, right? Well, I I use mm -hmm. the term estimation model. Have you ever heard of a uh, capability, maturity model, CMMI, Carnegie Mellons. I mean, this is probably mm -hmm. before your time because you're pretty young. You know, is it, this is a waterfall concept, but they're estimation models for actually how do you, are you really, are you literally looking it up right now? What I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. So back in the day, back in the day when, you know, we wrote good software, not just fast software, we had estimation models. And we actually, that they had different aspects of it where, which like, have you ever worked on this before? Is there an existing pattern? Do you have to interface with other teams? Do you have to integrate with different products? Who's doing the work? Is it a junior engineer or a senior engineer? And you did some maths, right? You brought, you took out your abacus, you did, did some calculations and boom, you had an estimate. What happened? Did, did you not learn about that at your universities? No, capability maturity model was not something that was taught. Uh, yeah. No one likes it because it's process, right? It's work and it's like, ah, oh, it takes me away from my keyboard and banging away and and my my printfs and my, you know, code lines and and and, it, and it's you know, you have to do some thinking. And yet, yet we don't do that anymore in the software world. Why do you think that is? Probably cuz it didn't work very well. Oh, because it was a bad predictive model or because the waterfall concept of fixed price contracts and being able to need think being able to needing to think out three years with set requirements, or was that the problem? I think I think there's several problems. I mean, most software development projects. I think we talked a little bit about this before, but before, but most software development projects, the requirements evolve as you do the project. Right? Would you agree with that? Absolutely. So as you as you begin to deliver capability to the end customer, they learn things about what they want and what they need and and the requirements develop and change. So trying to plan out software three years in advance just sounds absolutely ludicrous. I mean, look at what's happened with large language models in the last three months. It's like, you can't even keep up. There's so many changes happening. 
that makes absolute sense and that's absolutely why there are not fixed price contracts anymore unless you're building you know spaceships like that but but yes so but estimation models for estimating work somehow got lost in the mix right because if i if i said to you, okay we've got a jira or should i not be saying jira we've got a user story and and it's creating a brand new a brand new api to interface with a database we've never worked with before and um, you need a you need a high performing high performance throughput um, streaming service something like that right like you probably wouldn't hand that to a junior engineer right no right you'd probably want someone who's senior you'd probably want to, to ask them if they've worked on it before you probably want to ask them if you build it or buy it and and maybe even a little bit of upfront work but but you'd, you'd get a reasonable estimate right you'd you'd at least understand if it's going to be more or less than a year or more or less than a quarter more or less than a month or is it going to take you a week right you could probably get to those t-shirt sizes yeah yeah I, I, for the most part i think most of the time you should be able to get to a t-shirt size on a task like that you know get if it's going to be closer to a week than a quarter yeah you should you should most of the time be able to pretty accurately say that. Okay. So there's, so this is, believe it or not, this is all just the upfront context here. So, so we've gotten to a point where we understand how to measure things in time. We understand complexity and the aspects that go into complexity. So in all sincerity, when, it, when I, when we put a user story in front of an engineer and these are engineers of all levels and we say, okay, how long will this take? Why is it that so many engineers, and this is in your opinion, why do you believe that so many engineers, not only are they, dare I say, afraid to give estimates, um, but estimates are often like not even within the realm of response or within the realm of, you know, conceptual reality when you look at it to the actual. Um, and then over time, you know, the old adage of, oh, two more weeks, oh, two more weeks. Like, how do we get to a place where, you know, we could we can build things and fix time to a place where we can't even measure, right? Two weeks or four weeks or eight weeks. So there are, I think there are several factors here. Well, I mean, first of all, you asked about like, why are some engineers afraid to give estimates? Uh, and I, I think, you know, as a manager, I'm sure you know the answer to that question. And part of your job is to make people feel comfortable giving estimates, right? Because if people are afraid to give estimates, it probably means that they're afraid that they're somehow going to be held, you know, to that estimate, or it's going to, it's going to reflect very poorly on them if they don't hit it or something goes wrong or, or, or whatever. And so you, you get into these toxic situations where people are padding their estimates ridiculously and, and all kinds of things. Um, but, but beyond that, let's, let's, you know, let's assume, you know, people are, we got to a place where people are willing, you know, to, to make estimates. Um, I think the, the obvious mistakes are when you just kind of rush through doing the estimate, you know, you just kind of stick your finger up, you say, uh, yeah, it should be, you know, a couple of weeks. And you didn't think through, you know, all the, um, all the bits and pieces very carefully. You didn't think through like, well, how are we actually going to deploy this? How are we going to secure it? You know, like if I, if I'm the one writing this, like, is there a particular person I need to review it? And are they on vacation? And, you know, all there's, there's all kinds of little knowns that if you think about it for a while and, and you actually do do a little bit of that upfront planning and do a little bit of that work, you can get to a much better estimate, you know, than, than if you just kind of, eh, I'm kind of tired right now and don't feel like thinking about this, uh, you know, I'll throw out a number. So I want to touch a little bit on the first part because I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. You know, as a as a myopic middle manager, you know, I'm known for dates and names, dates and names. Matt, when's it going to be done? Matt, when's it going to be done? Matt, is it done? Is it done? Matt, you said it'd be done. Right? And I'm like, how did we get there? I want to I want to bring in a, a tangent from the side which is, you know, classic management wasn't weren't individual contributors. Like that was a thing, like you were a manager and you were never an individual contributor. And I've seen in our industry, probably, probably in the last five to 10 years, you know, you see all the time, like job postings. It's like, 
you know, you need to have been an individual contributor. And I, I think we had like a generation, we had a generation of myopic middle managers who didn't understand individual contributor work. They didn't understand complexities and what they understood was micromanagement and how that happened. I don't know, but I do think that we're recovering as an industry from that now. And I do think that to your point of, about, you know, making people feel comfortable is really important from a, you know, from a, what is that term from a, a leader, a culture, whatever, you know, anyway, but somebody who's a, who's a manager, who's going to be empathetic and sympathetic to the actual plight of trying to estimate. Do you buy that? Yeah. Yeah. You think it was, what, what do you, how do you think that happened? You think it was like the IBMs of the world and the Xeroxes and, you know, just like, oh, we need to deliver on time. No, you told me this. It has to be that way. Um, I don't, I don't really know, uh, how, how we ended up with, uh, you know, managers that didn't understand, you know, that, that weren't capable of doing the work of the people they were managing and that being like a widespread thing and, and everybody, and, and you know, being, that being just kind of like expected and, and then those managers not really having the empathy, generally speaking, to, um, you know, to, to understand when to press and when to be like, oh, okay, like this, this situation is actually, you know, more complicated than everybody thought because there were some unknown unknowns or, or whatever. I think, you know, well, one thing it could have been is, you know, when I got out of school, this would have been back in 97, software engineering was in high demand. So they're just, the quantity wasn't there. The quantity of individual contributors were needed to do the work and you had to bring in managers to manage because you didn't have enough software engineers. And we may be overcoming that now, right? Where there's there's kind of enough people out there who have actually done individual work, individual contributor work um, to make it to make it worthwhile. I I want to I want to touch on what you said um, and then I have another point, but what you talked about engineers kind of glossing over, uh, glossing over complexity and being like, oh, I don't have time to estimate. I'm just going to give something out. So are you familiar with the concept of bike shedding? Oh, yes. So I am a huge believer in bike shedding. So for listeners, bike shedding, please read about it. It's super interesting. I'm going to probably butcher the original bike shedding concept, but it was, you know, people at a nuclear power plant and um, they have three things on the agenda. One was reviewing the um, layout of the new plant. One was like, uh, what time are they going to have tea? And the third item was, you know, what color is the bike shed going to be? And the first item was reviewing the plans for the floor plan of the nuclear power plant and glossed it over and got it done in three minutes. Second thing was, and I don't remember the second part, but something like what well, time is tea. And I think they're like, oh, we always have tea at the same time. And then the third one was the color of the bike shed. And they spent 45 minutes of the meeting talking about the color of the bike shed because everybody has an opinion. So when it comes to subjective things that are easy to talk about, you end up spending your time talking about it when it comes to complex things and hard things and where you have to dig in and, you know, burn brain cells, you know, a lot of times people want to gloss over and that's a serious risk. And I, and I think it, you know, kind of shines light on that, where if you make a mistake <laughs> lay out of the nuclear power plant, because you glossed over it, like that's not something you want to do. Have you, have you seen that in this, in this industry, Matt? Oh yeah. I mean, you, you see this stuff constantly. And I think one of the, one of the biggest level ups you can have as an IC or a manager is to recognize when the conversation that's being had is, is not worth the oxygen that it's burning. Right. <laughs> like it, when you can just say like, we don't, we don't need to talk about this with nine people on the phone. Right. Like somebody just make a decision. Um, happens all the time. Uh, and, uh, the, the more it happens, the more kind of like depressed, you know, people are, cause it like, everyone starts to recognize after a while that like, these conversations aren't that useful. And it's, it's exacerbated if there are people in the room who only give their opinion, you know, when, when things, when it's about something subjective and cause that's, you know, you've got like a loud mouth who just wants to talk, but, um, can't weigh in on <laughs> the, uh, the detailed technical stuff. And, and it just kind of like drags the whole team down. 
All right. And I, I'm, I'm sure our listeners, a lot of folks have seen that. Uh, but I, want, I really want to talk about the third part, which is you, you use the term. Um, oh, shoot. I want to use my term, which is sandbagging. What term did you use? Inflating? Inflating the estimate? Yeah, I'm, I might have said padding. I'm not sure. Padding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the most important one to me. And this is what I was hoping we could spend our last uh, last few minutes here talking about. So sandbagging, sandbagging the concept of, well, I don't really know. So I'm just going to add 20 to 30% on it and, and just do the, like that. So sandbagging, in my opinion, as a manager, is the worst thing any software engineer can do. And the reason for that is, is the most healthiest relationships in companies are through trust, right? I talked about the chain, right? I opened up giggling, right? The chain of the engineers to the managers, to product, to sales, right? Up and down, you need to trust each other. You don't trust each other that you're going to get your estimates right. I mean, that's been the point in the beginning is that they're estimates, they're guesses, and they have confidence intervals, but, but they're estimates, right? But you, they need to trust that, that they believe you um, and, and that you will work on their behalf. And, and it's been my experience, actually, every, this is surprising. I don't know if this has been your experience, but every salesperson I've worked with, they just want somebody they can trust. That's it. That's it. They want to know that they're not going to be left hung out to dry. So... Right. So trust, you got to give an estimate. And if you start padding your estimates, you're going to be known. Aren't we? we used to call it a sandbagger, right? Oh, you're sandbagging your estimates. Well, people sandbag their estimates because of the myopic middle manager. So when you miss it, right, uh, everyone puts their thumb down on you. Um, it's been my experience and I've had, I've got tons of stories about this, but when you're honest with people and you say, this is what my estimate is, this is my I don't call it sandbagging. Some people will say it's the same, but I think about it different. It's an articulation of risk, right? If you're sandbagging just because you're afraid, that's wrong. If you're articulating risk because you've never worked with another product before, you've never worked with that team before, or if there's a brand new engineer, you can articulate that risk, right? But you got to be transparent with that. And I'm sure, you know, lots of people have done risk analysis. But when you, when you manage to your estimate and you're open with people, I was always taught you want to try to manage within 20% of your estimate. If you can get within 20%, you're good. Not, not a factor of two, mind you, but 20%. And just be honest because what's going to happen since they are estimates, they're going to balance uh, out. I lost you. So, so what, uh, are you, I can hear you. I can, are you, did you not pay your bill? See, you really should take this hundred dollars so you can pay your, your inner, maybe get a little upgrade. Maybe get an upgrade, a couple, a couple uh, mega, mega flops. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll see how that comes through in the recording. Um, okay. But okay. I, I missed, I missed probably ten seconds of you there. So, so trust, trust, trust is important. Articulate your estimates um, as, as risk. Do risk analysis, but, but be honest because what's going to happen with estimates? What happens with all estimates is they go both sides, right? So sometimes you're going to estimate too much. And sometimes you're going to estimate too little. Don't be that person. Don't be that engineer who always takes up all the time for their estimate. If you can deliver early, deliver early. Because if you can't deliver early, then people will, will understand that. And when you build that trust over time and you work with product and you work with sales and you're honest with them, they're going to support you because they know that you're trying and they know that estimates are in fact estimates. You buying this, Matt? You buying the trust factor? I I am, but there there are a few things actually I wanted to talk about um, with estimates because I think if if you do the things we talked about and you spend an appropriate amount of time in planning, you don't try to plan three years out. You try to plan you know a couple weeks out at fine granularity and a few more weeks at kind of a a coarser granularity. Most of the time, I think you can make reasonable estimates and most of the time you can hit them. And I think if you do that, that's enough to build that trust you're talking about. The circling back to the, the, the whole fear thing, I think the reason that a lot of engineers are afraid to make estimates, one other reason is that everyone has been, every engineer has been in a situation where they thought something was gonna be easy and they uncovered an unknown and they are staring at a terminal with an error on it that they don't understand and nothing's coming up on Google and they just have absolutely no idea how long it's going to take to debug 
right? Like there's there's an infinite stack of complexity under the thing they're looking at. There's an application stack, there's an operating system, there's a CPU, there's compilers. And they're just like, I, I don't know why this is happening. It doesn't make any sense. I'm completely blocked on it. And I have no idea how long it's gonna take me to figure this out. I don't even know where to start. That doesn't happen that often. But if, if that's what you're thinking about when someone asks you to make an estimate, that makes it really scary to make that estimate. I would call that an edge case, uh, you know, because I see lots where engineers don't want to make estimates. But but let's let's play that one out. I, I've been in those situations, and I actually find those easy to estimate. Remember, an estimation is just transparency in a measurement of time, right? I'm going to tell you how long I think it's going to take. So if I was at a terminal, if you handed me a, 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 a Linux terminal here with an error that I'd never seen before. And look, I'm, I'm a myopic middle manager, so I don't know anything about the technicalities of it. I can tell you exactly how long it would take. First, I'd spend less than an hour seeing if it was an easy fix, less than an hour. After the second hour, I'm going to go reach out to teammates, anybody at the company, right? And now if this is a production issue, I might accelerate this, but, but I'm going to spend one hour. And, and after one hour, I'm down the foxhole. So I'm done. I'm only giving myself an hour. Then I reach out to teammates. We probably got a couple hours. I don't know if we need a tiger team. I don't know how big of a deal this is. They got a couple hours. After a couple hours, I'm calling. I'm, I'm paying for professional services. Now that's not always possible, especially if it's a homegrown product, you know. But but I'm escalating as high as possible, right? Because if it can't get so, if if no one can give, no one at a company can give an estimate on how long something's going to take. That's mission critical for four hours. You got to go all hands on deck if it's if it's if it's that big of a deal, and. You know, I don't want to get into debate of open source community versus black box big companies, but the one benefit of a big box black company is black box company is that you can pay for professional services, right? You can make it somebody else's problem to solve and solve it with money. That's not always available, especially for a startup like ours. But that's how long I would take. I would I would say I think it's going to take one hour easy fix, four hours company wide. After that, we're probably in days because if it can't get solved by the entire company in four hours. And it's a really big problem. Yeah, I I think that is a great thing to think about for you know for any engineers listening. Don't don't put yourself you know as as the only one in the critical path. Remember that you're part of a team. Unless you're a single person startup, you're always part of a team, and that you may be the only engineer even. But it's important when. When you get into that situation where you've uncovered some unknown and like the risk has now shot through the roof, right? Like, like there's, you have to, you have to recognize that situation and then you have to bring in outside help and, uh, you know, and, and there's lots of different options for that. And, and it may be that product says, you know what, we're just not going to deliver that feature. We're going to route around it. We're going to do something different, uh, because we can't accept the level of risk in not knowing how long this is going to take to figure out. Um, so there's, there's always ways to, to, to wiggle around it. Um, and you know, if, if you are in that situation where there is no way around it and the thing has to be solved, and if you don't solve it, the company's going to go out of business. Um, at least you've recognized that and made everyone aware of it. And then you can go and give your full attention to the problem and, and try to figure it out. Right. But that it, it never happened. That, it doesn't, it just doesn't happen that way. So let's, um, let's get ready to close this up with, you know, Matt Jaffe. Do you like to be called Matt or Jaffe? What's your preference? Mr. Matt Jaffe? Ja ja Jaffe's good. Jaffe. All right. There's a lot so, of Matt's out there. It's, it gets confusing. So, you know, Let's just say this is a hypothetical. Hypothetical here. Let's say there's a user story, 1358. Let's just say user story 1358. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking to quite possibly, quite possibly one of the best engineers I know. Pro maybe, maybe probably. And I asked that engineer for an estimate and they're like, oh, I hope to go to review on Monday. And then, you know, Four days go by and they go, I hope to hope to go to review on Wednesday. And then about six days go by and they go, I hope to go to review on Tuesday. A couple more days go by and they go, the goal is the goal is to get this Friday. 
how how does a such a distinguished engineer kind of meander like that? Is this one of those situations where there's like a, a Unix terminal in front of them and, and they don't know what to do? What do you think's happening there? No, this this one is um, just not thinking through everything ahead of time and just putting a finger in the wind and saying, yeah, it should take about two weeks. Um, although I will say the original estimate was I thought Travis and I were both going to be working on it. And then he got pulled on to another thing. Um, but I didn't, I didn't think through all the deployment stuff I was going to need to do to get that thing out the door. Um, so yeah, that one was on me. It can happen to anybody. Um, spend a little bit of time on planning and estimation and you won't be off by a factor of two. That's interesting. Spend a little time planning. So you mean something like maybe like a checklist, a checklist which articulates, do I need to deploy this? Will I have teammates working with me? You know, what other complexities are involved with that? And maybe reusing that checklist, uh, maybe almost when you estimate every story. You know, I don't want to like be. A, that sounds like a great idea, Jason. It sounds like the kind of thing a manager could facilitate and and make sure it always gets done. <sighs> This is going to be the best podcast. You have just, you have made my day. You, I don't think anyone has ever made me feel as smart as you're making me feel right now. <laughs> so I think we've talked a lot of reasons, a lot of the upfront reasons of why engineers are afraid to give estimates. In my opinion, the first most important thing is um, engineers can't feel that, that they're giving you actuals because you're not asking for an actual. So when it doesn't hit the actual date, you know, don't be surprised. And I was to go, I would go as far as to say that if engineers are constantly hitting their estimate dates on the day, it, something's going up, right? Because that's not how estimates work. When you go to the restaurant and you say, is my table going to be ready? And they say 30 minutes, it's never 30 minutes on the money, on the money. That's why it's an estimate. But if you get past the trust aspect, make sure engineers know that these estimates set expectations up and down the business and, and, the people who can't do the engineering rely on the engineers to signal and inform product and sales and ultimately people who pay your paychecks. Because our customers, they need to know when things are available so they can do product marketing and launch plans and all of that stuff. Um, so Matt, do you feel, I'm sorry, Jaffe, do you feel this has been a pretty, pretty informative podcast? Honestly, I think it's been super boring. People are going to hate this one. <laughs> Estimates for the most boring topic. And yet, Can I get back to writing code now, please? So uh, that is uh, that is all that I have. Uh, Matt, do you have any uh, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, Any if there's any feedback about the show or uh, anything you'd like to hear us talk about, please let us know. Um, you can email smartandsnark at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Twitter, Twitter at smart snark cast. Um, and I guess you could leave a YouTube comment. And I think Jason kind of, you know, watches those uh, maniacally. So uh, we'll probably see it. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. Thanks a lot.